Welcome to the ultimate Qingche guide. It goes without saying that Qingche has become a fan favorite, whether you like her for how relatable she is, or that she can take down gods by throwing tiles at them. We can all agree on one thing. She's just a little gremlin trying to do the things she enjoys most. To succeed with Qingche, you'll need to embrace this way of life, and today I'm here to show you how it's done. We may not be a lifelong species, but we're certainly lifelong learners. So get your thinking hats on and get ready to learn the way of the Celestial Jade. As always, I've left timestamps for each section, so feel free to skip ahead to what you're looking for. Qingche is undeniably a strong DPS character, and at higher Eidolons in investment, she can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best. Let's quickly go over her kit before moving on to the advanced section to talk about probability and unique gameplay tips. Her entire playstyle revolves around her tile mechanic. She starts out with zero tiles, and there are three different suits. Her talent lets her draw one at the beginning of each ally's turn, including her own. And she draws two tiles on each use of her skill. Her skill also does not end her turn and can be used repeatedly. Additionally, each use of her skill increases her damage, stacking up to four times. If she's holding the max of four tiles, every new tile gain will replace the tile of the least occurring suit. Using a basic attack that's not enhanced will also drop the tile of the least occurring suit, and once she gets four tiles of the same suit, her talent will trigger and she'll enter the hidden hand state. She won't be able to use her skill anymore, and her basic attack becomes the enhanced basic attack cherry on top. While in this state, she'll also gain a massive attack percent increase. Using her enhanced basic attack will deal a large amount of damage to the primary target and a smaller amount to enemies adjacent to it. This also ends her hidden hand state and resets her tile count back to zero. The final part of her kit is her ultimate, which deals a large amount of AoE damage to all enemies. It also gives Qingche a four of a kind, which will let her immediately enter the hidden hand state on her next action. This is what I like to call hard pity, and it's a very powerful ultimate that has a lot of uses. One last note, Qingche's technique allows her to draw two tiles before a battle starts, but this may not always be preferable, since you have less opportunities to buff herself with her skill. This is probably the most important section of the video, and it'll help you get the most out of our little gacha addict. Let's start by going over some crucial mechanics that you should know about and make use of. The first one is something that I use all the time. For simplicity, let's call Qingche's hidden hand state a phantom turn. Whenever a buff is applied to Qingche during her phantom turn, the duration is not consumed once that phantom turn ends. You'll see this demonstration here with Branya's ult. Two turns left. Now we throw our cherry on top and the turn ends. Let's wait until Qingchu's next turn. Two turns again on Branya's ult, which would normally last two turns, but here we can see it can last three turns. This also works with Tingen's ult and any other buffs that have a set turn duration. The explanation for this is that Qingche's phantom turn behaves the same way as Sele's resurgence after she defeats an enemy. It's almost like getting an extra turn, but any buffs that are applied during this state aren't consumed once it's over. Anyway, you can see how strong this interaction is, and to put it into perspective, you're getting a 50% increase in buff uptime. When you put it that way, you can kind of understand why she's got so much potential. The next one, and very critical to Qingche's rotations, is her alt usage. Despite her high alt cost of 140, and her basic and enhanced basic attacks only generating 20 energy, she doesn't actually have energy issues. Qingche is unique in that she's one of the rare characters that don't rely on casting her alt straight away. You almost never want to use it on cooldown, and there are many situations that we need to consider. Let's start from the top. If you have your ult and you're out of Qingche's turn and you use it, you don't get any damage percent buffs from stacking skill uses, and you also miss out on the attack percent bonus from being in the hidden hand state. So you almost never want to use it when it's not Qingche's turn. Now, let's say we don't have four of a kind, we're in turn, but we also have our ult. If we have skill points, we want to start using them. Now, some of you might be worried that this can be a waste, especially if you're starting with a low number of matching tiles, but just hang on. The reason we're using our skill is to not only give ourselves a chance at the four of a kind, but also to stack our damage buff. Additionally, having the alt full is a free get out of jail card. If we don't manage to get the four of a kind, we can simply use our alt into the guaranteed basic attack during this same turn, so we don't lose out on that damage bonus. This get out of jail free card also has one more application, and is especially useful when you have E4. This is indicated below that health bar as seen on screen by that little purple spade looking thing. 
The worst feeling in the world is when you're rolling and you hit your E4 proc, but you use up all your skill points without getting the 4 of a kind. If you have your alt, you can use it immediately to get your 4 of a kind, so that not only can you throw out your regular enhanced basic attack, but the E4 also gets thrown. So my recommendation is to save your alt for a turn when you know you're about to use a lot of skill points, that way you get the damage buffs on your alt, as well as saving you when you don't get that 4 of a kind. The last scenario, and one I hear a lot about, is using her alt right after getting a 4 of a kind. Let's break this down. When you get your 4 of a kind, you enter the hidden hand state, which means you get your massive attack percent bonus. If you use your alt while in the state, you actually benefit from that attack bonus. If you use your skill that turn, you'll still get the damage percent bonus on both your enhanced basic attack and alt, regardless of order. But just know that if you use your enhanced basic first, you don't get that attack buff on your alt. Qingxia's alt hits all enemies for the same amount and it hits really hard. That's why it's important to maximize its damage and this way she can quickly wipe out waves of enemies. There is an issue with using her alt before her enhanced basic and it's that we're consuming the free get out of jail card that we'd normally have. This is because after using the alt, we get the enhanced basic attack and we're forced to use it. Now on the other side of this is the reason why you see me doing this a lot. I intentionally do this to dump my next turn's free 4 of a kind from the alt. We'll go over this more in the probability section but let me tell you why I do this first. If you start a turn with the 4 of a kind, you don't get a chance to use your skill, which doesn't allow you to get that damage buff stacking. On the other hand, if you're using her skill, you're wasting more skill points and you're not even guaranteed to get the 4 of a kind by rolling. The thing is, there's a balance between doing more damage and doing consistent damage. The general guideline here is, if you can ensure Qingxia begins her next turn with 3 skill points, which is ideal since you have 3 other teammates generating skill points, then you're safe to dump your ult and free enhanced basic attack. If you can't guarantee that you'll have 3 skill points at minimum on her next turn, just use her enhanced basic attack first and then ult. The thing with Qingxia is, you want to get lucky, but you don't want to get too lucky. Speaking of which, it's now time to dive into the probability section. For ease of reading, I've rounded percentages to the nearest whole number. I think you'll be surprised to hear that over a large sample size of runs, it's actually really hard to get unlucky with Qingxia. I would classify unlucky as either needing to use 3 to 4 skill points and not getting her 4 of a kind, or getting her 4 of a kind off the rip every single time and not being able to use her skill points to buff her. Let's get the easy one out of the way, her E4. There's an Eidolon breakdown later on, but I thought it'd be good to include this here as well. The chance to trigger her E4 on each skill use is 24%. However, since we're able to use her skill in succession, we can calculate the probability as shown on screen. The key takeaway here is that after 3 skill uses, you're more likely than not to get her E4 proc. 56% is a significant chance to obtain her E4 and may surprise some of you. Of course, it's still not guaranteed and you'll still have runs where you don't get it at all or you get it every single turn. But on average, you should be getting it more often than not after using her skill 3 times. Now, Tile Probability. I'll try to simplify this as much as possible since there are way too many scenarios, but we can come up with a good conclusion after looking at the important ones. If you have 3 tiles of matching suits, you have a 56% chance to get a 4 of a kind on 1 skill use, 80% on 2 skill uses, and a 91% chance to get it on 3 skill uses. If you have 2 tiles of matching suits and 2 others of different suits, you have an 11% chance to get a 4 of a kind on 1 skill use, 54% chance on 2 skill uses, and 78% chance on 3 skill uses. More often than not, you won't be starting Qingxia's turn with no matching tiles, but let's go over the probability of that anyway. Say you have one of each suit, then of course, the chance to get a 4 of a kind on the first skill is 0%, then 32% after 2, and then 68% after 3 skill uses. Numbers are great, but what's the takeaway here? We really want to be setting up Qingxia with at a minimum of 3 skill points when her turn starts, and that's my final recommendation. Okay, let's move on to the build section. For trace leveling, prioritize her basic attack first and foremost. You definitely want to max this out, and it also costs the least resources since it only goes up to level 6 or 7 if you have E5. There's no real priority for the other ones, as you want to level them all, but if you want it in order, level up the skill, followed by the alt, and then the talent. You definitely want to pick up all her major traces since you'll also unlock the nodes for attack percent and quantum damage, but I'll quickly go over each one. 
The Ascension 2 passive is probably the least impactful, but it's very good for short fights since you essentially get two free tile rolls and a stack of her damage bonus. Her Ascension 4 has pretty good value, giving her an extra 10% damage bonus on each skill cast. So if you have a level 12 skill, instead of a 30% damage bonus per stack, it's 40%. This can go up all the way to 160% at 4 stacks. Her A6 is a nice speed bonus and can help at times, but it's a little unreliable to plan speed breakpoints for, since some turns you won't be using her enhanced basic. Light Cone Options. This one's fairly straightforward. The Battle Pass Light Cone, today is another peaceful day at S1, is comparable to, but actually performs slightly worse than an S5 seriousness of Breakfast. S5 Breakfast is definitely the best free-to-play option and what I'd recommend. Peaceful Day at higher super positions does overtake Breakfast, but not by a significant amount. Unless you're extremely dedicated to maxing out Qingqie, I'd advise against going for those super positions. Finally, Before Dawn is her best in slot, and although it's not that much better than an S5 Peaceful Day, it's still clearly the top option. I did want to point out one honorable mention, and it may surprise you, if you can maintain the buff on an S5 Genius's Repose, it's actually relative in strength to an S1 Before Dawn, only 1 or 2 percentage points lower. I got this info from Jamie, who also made an in-depth guide for Qingqie, I'll leave a link to his video in a pinned comment so make sure to check it out. The buff on Genius's Repose actually lasts for 3 turns, so it's a lot more manageable than you'd think, and since Qingqie will be the main damage dealer in most of her teams, it's not unrealistic that she'll be constantly defeating enemies. So if you have this at higher super imposition levels, I would 100% recommend you use it. I also want to make a note that although Before Dawn is her current best in slot, it won't take much for another 5 star erudition light cone to overtake it. Qingqie is already very saturated in damage percent buffs, and she'll be more receptive to stats in the crit and attack department, which is also why Genius's Repose is almost her best option. So be on the lookout, let's hope we can get some more 4 and 5 star erudition light cone options in the future, and anything that is crit and attack buffs should be a perfect fit for our Qing Queen. Relics. There's a clear winner here and it should be to no one's surprise, 4 piece genius of brilliant stars stands head and shoulders above the rest. But we all know that relic farming can be a pain and if you have better substats, and it doesn't take much, 3 to 4 more effective rolls in crit and attack can make mixed sets perform better. Our ranking will go in order of genius of brilliant stars 4 piece, mixed 2 piece genius with 2 piece musketeer, and then 4 piece musketeer. Do try and aim for that 4 piece brilliant though, you definitely want to take advantage of the strongest DPS set in the game. For planar sets, Rudolin Arena is better than Sal Soto, though again, if you have better substats on your Sal Soto, it can be stronger. The other consideration to make is that 70% crit rate is a lot harder to hit, and even I'm not there, so I wouldn't be able to get those bonuses. My recommendation is to go with whichever one has the best subsets, provided that you can hit the minimum crit rate threshold of either 50% for Sal Soto or 70% for Rudolins. I do want to make a note that even though Sal Soto increases the follow-up attack damage of Qingqie's E4, it still doesn't beat out Rudolin Arena. Space Ceiling Station is not a bad option, but it still falls short of the other two. If you are using this set, make sure you hit the 120 speed target, which might require you to use speed boots. As for relic stats, crit rate body no question unless you somehow have stacked crit rate rolls and can go for a crit damage body. Attack or speed boots, I'll go more in depth in a second. Quantum damage orb and attack rope. While Qingqie has a high energy cost of 140 and only regening 20 on her normal and enhanced basic attacks, it's not impactful enough to sacrifice the massive loss in attack for an energy regen rope. As for substats, it's your standard crit rate, crit damage, and attack percent priority. Speed is a nice to have, but won't provide as much value unless you're going for specific speed breakpoints. As far as boots go, it'll largely depend on playstyle, but I'll go over both of them and give you my final recommendations. If you're running a main DPS Qingqie, attack boots are preferable. Even if you can get more actions with speed boots, you won't be getting as many effective actions. What I mean by effective actions is, it's a turn where you're capitalizing on using her skill and then throwing out her enhanced basic attack. It's also even less favorable once you factor in buff uptime. If Qingqie is getting more actions and her teammates aren't able to support her skill point needs, there will be turns where you're throwing out regular basic attacks, consuming and wasting a turn of any buffs applied on her. Even if you can give Qingqie more actions with speed boots, it won't mean anything if they aren't hitting as hard. If you're playing sub DPS Qingqie, or if you're playing E6 Qingqie, this changes a bit and you can actually afford to run speed boots, and even more so if you're running her with Branya. I'll go over this more in the team section later, but my recommendation is just go attack percent boots. Eidolons. Oh boy. Although Qingqie doesn't need any Eidolons to function as either a main or sub DPS, 
the later ones are undoubtedly very strong. Everyone does get a free copy of Qingche near the start of the game, so many of you may have some of her Eidolons already. Just an FYI, she is in this month's Star Glitter shop rotation, so that is an option worth considering. E1 is a 10% damage increase to her ult, and while her ult does hit hard, she already gets a lot of damage percent bonuses, so the actual value of this Eidolon is pretty low. I'll now take this opportunity to introduce my new tile rating system. The more tiles, the better, ranging from 1 to 4. We'll give her E1 one tile. It also loses some marks because her enhanced basics do more damage in her overall rotation. Her E2 gives her one energy every time she gains a new tile. To put it simply, you gain one energy every time an ally's turn starts, and two energy every time you use her skill. You'll see this on screen, but even if you're only gaining one new tile with your skill, you still get two energy. This is surprisingly more impactful than you think, and it's actually more effective energy than an energy regen rope would give. That being said, she doesn't rely too much on her ult, but since it's still a nice quality of life Eidolon, it'll get a 2 tile rating. E3 increases the levels of her ult and talent by 2, which is pretty underwhelming, so it gets 1 tile. E4. This easily gets a 4 tile rating. I would say this is the most fun Eidolon in the game currently, and this is one of the only Eidolons I would consider getting from the Star Glitter shop. It adds an entirely new dynamic to her kit, and it makes her that much more enjoyable to play. You have a 24% chance to get her E4 on each skill use, and again, it's indicated by the little purple thingy underneath her health bar, and throwing out any basic attack with this passive triggered will cause Qingxu to throw out another one as a follow-up attack. This follow-up attack will mimic the one that you throw out first, so if you throw out a regular basic, then it'll follow that, or if you throw out an enhanced basic, it will also be an enhanced basic. This is how you get all your crazy combos, and often why Qingxu can do hundreds of thousands of damage per turn. If you recall from our probability section, after 3 skill uses, we have roughly a 56% chance to get it, so you'll be getting it more often than not. Also, not only does it throw another basic, it deals additional quantum break equal to that of the initial basic attack type used. The E4 also counts as a follow-up attack, so if you're using Sal Soto or Before Dawn, it'll also benefit from those bonuses. One important callout that I will make though, is that her E4 attack will never get the attack percent bonus from being in the hidden hand state where you have a 4 of a kind. When she throws out her enhanced basic attack, the hidden hand state ends because she'll consume the 4 of a kind. That being said, E4 can benefit from the damage bonuses stacked from her skill, so it'll still dish out a lot of damage. E5 increases the levels of her skill by 2, and her basic attack by 1. This is actually quite a nice bonus to the base multiplier for a basic attack, so I'll give it a 2 tile rating. Finally, at the pinnacle of Qingche, E6. This is a big one, as it allows Qingche to recover a skill point after using her enhanced basic attack. Needless to say, this is an extremely powerful Eidolon, and although it doesn't directly increase her damage, it provides enough value that I'm willing to give it a 4 tile rating. There are so many more lines of play that can be explored with this Eidolon, since you can afford to be a lot greedier. You'll also be able to use her skill a lot more, which means you'll be getting more chances at getting 4 of a kinds, triggering her E4, stacking more of her damage percent bonus, as well as regening more energy with her E2. The best way I can describe E6 for you is it's like giving Qingxia a stim pack. Everything she does well already gets amplified by a significant amount. The most important part about this Eidolon though, is that you'll be able to gamble more with Qingxia and that'll make her happy. Qingxia is a character that is very receptive to buffs. Since she can front load all her damage onto a single turn, she's really good at taking advantage of her supports. Let's take a quick look at which characters pair well with her playstyle. It goes without saying that for enemies with no quantum weakness, Silver Wolf is by far her best. Her all res reduction from her skill and def down from her ult also greatly amplify Qingxia's damage to a single target. Even if enemies have quantum weakness, she's still a top 3 partner for her. Although Branya will be using lots of skill points, she's absolutely crazy and you can actually make them work even with the high skill point usage. My recommendation is have Qingxia be faster than Branya so that she can take the first move. Branya can then use her skill on Qingxia to give her another action. This sequence is already skill point neutral since the basic cancels out Branya's skill. Now, with all of Branya's damage percent bonuses stacked, we can gamble away for a big turn. As mentioned in the advanced tip section, we can extend Branya's alteration on Qingxia to 3 turns by timing it right when Qingxia gets her 4 of a kind. All in all, Branya is an insane buffer that'll take Qingxia to the next level. Tingyun is another great partner, providing a sizable attack increase and extra hits of lightning damage from Benediction. 
Tingyun's ult also increases Qingxue's damage and refills her get out of jail free card. Ideally, you want to save Tingyun's ult the same way we do with Bronya's, which is waiting for Qingxue to enter the hidden hand state before casting it. This way we can extend the buff duration from 2 to 3 turns. Pella is another solid option and in certain fights can even overtake Silver Wolf in terms of value. Not only does she have a massive 40% death shred to all enemies with a near 100% uptime, she's also completely skill point positive, letting our little gremlin gamble as much as she wants. Asta is another good pick. Her benefits are primarily from her massive attack and speed bonuses. I'll go more in depth with Asta in the team building section, but I also wanted to say, if you have multiple copies of Branya's Light Cone, it'll give these Harmony characters a lot more value since they'll be able to generate more skill points for your team. I wanted to briefly touch on Yukong since she's able to provide some pretty substantial buffs. It's not that she's clunky to use, it's just that the other options we have are far more consistent. If you do want to use her, I recommend adopting a skill point neutral playstyle by alternating back and forth between her skill and basic. Of course, you'll also need to make sure she goes right before or two turns before Qingxue. Yukong really only shines in some niche use cases where she can enable Qingxue to zero cycle certain fights. As far as teams go, there isn't really a best for every situation, but if I had to choose, it would be Qingxue, Branya, Silverwolf, and a solo sustain. Since this isn't accessible to everyone, let's go into substitutes because they're all very close in terms of strength. In situations where you don't need the quantum weakness implant, Pella can be a great replacement for Silverwolf and the team would function the exact same. The only difference is that Qingxue will have more skill points at her disposal since Pella doesn't need to use her skill. This team is also stronger in AoE situations. I actually don't recommend using Asa with Branya together because it can mess up with speed tuning. If you give Qingxue more actions, the buff will actually expire on Qingxue but not on Branya, so you won't get the perfect pull forward with Branya's skill. That being said, a good replacement for Branya is Asta, and this way Qingxue gets the benefits of having more actions without needing to become more skill point intensive. Finally, Tingyun can be slotted interchangeably with the second or third buffer here as well. All these variations are plenty strong and each one has their own advantages. I wanted to quickly go over Qingxue as a sub DPS since it's also very viable and doesn't rely as much on her Eidolons. Her build doesn't change at all and she can be slotted into pretty much any team as a skill point positive damage dealer. One example I'll give is Mono Quantum with a solo sustain, possibly Fushan or Lynx when they come out, Sele as your main damage dealer and skill point consumer, Silverwolf, and Qingxue. Qingxue can supplement a lot of AoE damage on this team and she can do it effectively while generating skill points. She'll be spamming her basic attacks, throwing out her enhanced basic and ult when available, but you can still find situations where you can afford to dump skill points on her to go for a large nuke. The best way to learn is by doing, so let's take a look at how she plays out and I can explain each of my thought processes live. So here we have three tiles on Qingxue, we're going to use Branya's skill to pull her forward. Now we want to get our 4 of a kind, and then use Branya's ult. This way we can extend her buff to 3 turns instead of 2, like we've mentioned many times before. Let's take a quick look at her stats. Currently it lasts for 2, we can see all the stat effects, and just in case there's anything that can mess this up. Doesn't look like it though, so we can keep going. Remember that we always want to start Qingxue's turn with at least 3 skill points, so we'll be planning around that. We should be expecting Qingxue to start her turn with 2 turns remaining on Branya's alt buff. Right now we're just trying to target the Ascended down with Silverwolf, making sure we get the Quantum applied. Unfortunately we do not get it, but that's okay, this is just a demonstration of Qingxue's rotations. After this fish attacks us we can check her stats, and sure enough, 2 turns remaining on the Bellabog March, perfect. Now we've got enough skill points to continue rolling, we get our E4 proc indicated in the bottom health bar there. And we unfortunately don't crit, but that's okay. We do have our ult now and we could use it out of turn, but we'd rather use it when we're buffed by Branya. We still have to take out the rest of the wave, so I decide to use my ult here instead of going for rolls. This way we can secure the wave cleared in zero cycles. We unfortunately do lock ourselves into a guaranteed 4 of a kind, which means we won't be able to use Qingxue's skill on the next turn, and that way we won't benefit from all those damage percent bonuses. We're going to start us off with dumping Qingxue's 4 of a kind, this way we can spend the next turn rolling. 
It goes without saying that you want to apply all your debuffs before Qingchui gets to move. That way you get the maximum damage possible. So here we're throwing it out. One thing I always do is I try to prioritize the target in the middle that has the most health. And with Qingchui's enhanced basic, you do damage to the two side ones. So here, instead of attacking the silver main lieutenant, we're actually going to attack the ascended. That way we get the most damage possible and in case, because we got E4, if we actually take him out with the first hit, then the second shot won't go out. Very unfortunately, we don't crit on either of those attacks, so the Ascended still has a lot of health remaining. Now we're hoping to pull out the win here by going for our rolls. One, two, three. So we get a ton of damage percent bonus. It's over 100% from Qingche's skill herself, about 100% from Branya, so we're at almost 200% damage bonus. We get our ult in the middle of the sequence, so we press it really quick, that way we still get the damage percent bonuses on our ult, and there you go, we finish off the wave in zero cycles. And there you have it, you now have everything you need to succeed with Qingche. If you found any of this information helpful, do consider dropping a like and subscribe. Your support means a lot to me, so thank you. I don't think I've put this much time and effort into a video before, but it was definitely worth it. Ching is my favorite character in the game, and I hope this can help you enjoy her as much as I do. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Let's try it together. Ching Chue. Ching Chue. Not Xingku, not QQ, Qingque. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. <laughs>